sure I just get myself fixed up here. Yeah. Well, it's lovely to be here again. Um, and thank you for the warm welcome I always receive. I'd just like to open in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, I just pray that um, we might know your presence with us now. Pray, precious Holy Spirit, that you will just guide me and lead me because I'm just overwhelmingly aware, Lord, of my own frailty and how much I need you, Lord, in every step and in everything I've prepared. So please be with us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Many years ago, um, I spoke to a lad who'd just come out of prison, and um, I was chatting away to him, and we got mentioned talking about the Bible, and he said, um, I said, this Jesus, he just seems too good to be true. He said, you know, he says, I read about him, but I can't believe that anyone would love that much. You know, it could be that good, you know. And so I forget how the conversation went, but we just chatted for a little bit more. And then many years before that, my mum had said to me, she said, Steve, she said, Every part of me would love to believe that Jesus, this Jesus existed, that he was as wonderful as all the films make out and that the Bible makes out, she said. But she had a very um, austere upbringing in the church that she belonged to and she certainly never saw the love of Christ reflected in the way she was brought up. Now, when I first read this verse... But Jesus said, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. I struggled to believe that. I thought, how can God, who knows me inside out, how can God, who knows everything about me, knows me a hundred times better than I know myself, how can he possibly love me that much? And I really struggled with it. I thought perhaps if I look at it in context, he's only talking to the disciples. Or if I look at it... Uh, maybe you start looking at the Greek, I realise that it's diluted slightly, and he doesn't mean that, that. That he loves me as much as he loves his son. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. I mean, Jesus could have made many other comparisons. He could have said, as a brother loves a brother. And we thought, oh yeah, that, that would have been good, you know. Or he could have said, as a close friend loves a close friend. Or as a mother loves a child. But we know they're all imperfect in the illustrations because... There are many brothers who clash with brothers. There are many close friends who fall out. And there are many mother, mothers and children who didn't have an ideal relationship. But he said, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. How did the Father love the Son? Well, if we go through the scriptures, we're told that the Father loved his Son without end, without beginning, without end. It was an eternal love. In the relationship within the Trinity, the Father and the Son were one of love. The Father rejoiced in the Son. The Father delighted in his Son. His love was unchanging for the Son. It was a love that never deserted him. A love that hurt when he hurt. And I know somebody said to me once, well, surely um, when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Wasn't that, wasn't that God, Jesus feeling that he was no longer with, it, with his father? Um, some people have said that, but I, I, it was only a little while later that Jesus cried out, into your hands I commit my spirit. So no matter what Jesus was going through, the father loved his son. We had um, a, an Alpha course uh, on Friday at Chatterbox, and uh, part of the Alpha course is where they stop and ask people in the street, what was Jesus famous for? And some of the things that came back was, um, oh, he was famous for his miracles. That's what Jesus is famous for. Um, he was famous for his teachings, um, famous for the claims that he made. One or two with tongue-in-cheek said he was famous for his sandals. But, <laughs> but then a lot said he was famous for being someone who died on the cross. But the most, one 
thing that came about more than anything else was he was famous for his love. It was Gandhi who said, um, I love your Christ, but I'm not so keen on your Christians. Um, Gandhi went on to say that he just saw in Jesus a life that overflowed with compassion, purity and love. But for some reason he couldn't see that being passed on to the church. So as the Father has loved the Son, so has Jesus loved us. How did Jesus love his disciples? If you go through the Gospels, you just see how very patient he was with his disciples. I think at times they must have exasperated him. You know, you know Jesus said at times, haven't you still learned the lesson? You know, he was frustrated at um, how their knee-jerk reaction at certain things, but he loved them still. He humbly ministered to them when he washed the feet of all the disciples, including Judas. He sat and he taught them. He spent time with them. He was a good shepherd. He protected them. He assured them of his love. He loved them even when they deserted him. He loved them even when they denied him. He loved them even when they were hiding in fear in the upper room, wondering what was going on and doubting his resurrection. He loved them. Now, over the years, I've spoken to many people who've um, said to me, I'm beginning to doubt whether God loves me. You know, and uh, that's not an easy question to answer. And somebody brought it up earlier, you know, people will be saying, why is this happening in Turkey? Why is, it, why is that taking place? And to be honest, there are no easy answers at times to give. But to know that God is sovereign and he's still in control. I suppose over the years of um, working with some of the people that Kate and I work with at Chatterbox, uh, we've come across people who've doubted their own ability to do things and something that we try and chat about is to encourage people to realise that they do have the ability to do these things and to give them tasks. They doubt that others really like them or want to spend time with them. They doubt that anybody can really truly understand them. It was C.H. Spurgeon, the great preacher, who said these words, None of us, brethren, would not, could not, and dare not doubt the love that the Father has for the Son. And that same love is poured out for his Son upon us. Don't try and work it out, just rejoice in it and be amazed that God loves you that much. Jesus says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Throughout this, there's this close link of obedience. It doesn't mean if somebody's disobedient that Jesus no longer loves him, but to experience the love of Christ, for it to have an impact, that love to have an impact on our lives, there must be obedience. There must, we must abide with Christ. We must stay close to him. What does it mean to abide in his love? As Christians, we call Jesus our Lord and our Saviour and our Teacher. And he is our Lord, he's our Saviour and his Teacher, our Teacher. Are our lives centred in him? Do we meditate upon his words? Do we seek to worship him and pray to him throughout the day? Do we ask the Holy Spirit to help us be Christ-like in everything that we do? There's two little things, and I'm not saying that this is right, this is just what I found very helpful in my own Christian life, is that for me to abide in Christ is that every action that I do, I do as if I'm serving him. So on Tuesday morning, when we do the bacon butties for all the lads at Salton, I commit that to him. Lord, I'm doing it for these lads, but I'm doing it for you as well. You know, This is, I'm doing it for your glory, I'm doing it for your honour. Each and every person that we speak to, as if I'm talking, as if I'm ministering to Christ himself. Jesus himself said, there's a part in scripture where Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was in need of food, you fed me. And they said, when did we do this? And he said, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me.
And in verse 11, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And he used to think, this was said in the shadow of the cross. Calvary wasn't that far away. And Jesus is talking about these things. And he's saying, so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. I thought, wow. And now somewhere else in Hebrews, it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. It wasn't that Jesus went to Calvary with a big grin on his face and uh, that there was no distress there. But Jesus knew that what lay ahead of him. He knew what his death upon the cross would achieve. He knew the joy of the resurrection that would come. He knew that men and women would be changed by his love. He would see his kingdom grow. And the early disciples as well had to know that joy. They had to know the joy that no matter what trials or situations they were facing, God was in control. You see the Apostle Paul um, in 2 Timothy. His head is literally on the executioner's block. He knows that death isn't that far away. And he said, my life is being poured out like a drink offering, yet there awaits me a crown. So despite all that he was going through, he knew that God was in control. My own testimony, I... Um, there were, a couple of years ago, I went through quite a bad time of depression um, and it was quite heavy. And it was at a time where in a very short period of space, I lost my mum through um, having, she had really bad face cancer and that was distressing to see what it done to her and, you know, sort of what she went through. And then my dad through dementia and having to go down most weekends and deal with that. And um, I wasn't exactly rejoicing. I knew God was still in control and I was trusting God. But a well-intentioned Christian person said to me, your joy must shine through. Be joyful, be joyful. I said, I don't feel like being joyful at the moment. You know? I'm feeling really low and I'm struggling. You know, And so what we know is that we go through difficult times in life, but we know no matter what situation we're in, no matter what it is, that God will guide us through. Mark was talking about the trials that he faced. And knowing that God is in control and that God would get him through those trials. So we know how much the Father loves the Son. And the Son, then Jesus says, As far as love me, so have I loved you. Are we allowing his love to change us? Are we allowing his Holy Spirit to work in our lives and produce that love? For a church that stops loving each other begins to die. We cannot love and have enmity at the same time. Now if you go through the New Testament letters, there's so many things that encourage us to love one another. To love one another in deed and in truth. To love one another with humility, gentleness and patience. Be kind and tender-hearted. Be forgiving. And also know when to ask for forgiveness. Don't bear grudges. I believe one of the greatest evidence of God's presence of the Holy Spirit is a church that loves. And I remember, I know the last couple of times I've been here, I've mentioned this, but it was on my heart again today to um, let me get a drink of water. Sorry. When I came to this church all those years ago, I was coming through a difficult time, and um, the first people that I met who loved me and invited me to the church were Jenny and Clem, and invited me into the house, and uh, I came along, and uh, they made me welcome. In fact, them. Um, Reflecting back on that, I was working for a, a, a charity organisation um, over in Portsmouth, and I had a little um, thing on my thing that simply said, "Jesus is Lord." Sorry, if it keeps going off. I can't mute the message thing on it <coughs> or something. And um, I remember Clem <coughs> leaning over and saying, "I totally agree with that." And he asked me where I stood as a Christian, and I was telling him I was uh, I hadn't recently I'd only recently come to the Lord, and I was looking for a church to find that was ex-military, and uh, so I told him all this. And Clem invited me round, and I met Jenny, and they gave me a lovely meal. And then I came along, and uh, they might not remember it, but the, one of the first people that I met, thank you, Brian and Anne, you were so kind to 
us when we first came into AUC. Um, I remember the kindness of Dave Wiltshire and welcomed me into the church. I remember the kindness of the stranger who, when I couldn't afford to go to um, away to the Isle of Wight for the weekend, paid for me. Just saw a church just so full of love and grace and bearing wonderful fruits. And I think though um, you know that I, people know me, as I'm not the Christian that says, God told me to say this and God told me to say that. I'm never, I've never said I've got a hotline to God in which I hear his voice all the time. But on my heart is just to say these words, that God can restore the years the locusts have eaten. He can. And then Jesus says these words. This is my commandment, love, the same way I've loved you. There is no greater love than to lay one's life down for one's friend. I think the the disciples followed Jesus. They would have seen love in action. (laughs) They would have seen the love of Christ displayed to the sick, the poor, the outcasts, even those who would consider Jesus to be their enemy. And I believe that as Jesus said this, he looked at his disciples and said, there is no greater love than someone laid down his life for his friend. And you are my friends. Throughout this whole thing, there's this repeated emphasis of being loved, of loving one another, of self-sacrifice giving love. It's been on my heart about sacrificial love. And then he went out the window after about 25 minutes of the rugby today when Mary said, can you make me a cup of tea? What? <laughs> Rugby's on! <laughs> yeah. I took a deep breath, put it on pause and made a, made a cup of tea. But I said, if I'm going to talk about sacrificial love, then, you know, hang on. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said in one of his letters, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Many years ago when I was at Salton, um, at St. Mary's, uh, when I was working, still work, I still work with Kate at Chatterbox, um, but um, this was when um, we, it was with Champions at the time. Um, and I remember being there and this mum, lady walking in, and right away her, her, her face was just etched with such grief and pain. And um, she said, could somebody pray with me? So. She went on to tell me that she'd been laying flowers at her son's graveyard. And um, I said, I'm sorry to hear that. She told me the story how her son had been in Afghanistan, uh, had been on patrol when an IED had gone off and taken off both his knees. Um, I mean, he would never serve in the army again. He, he survived that. But as he was lying there, a friend of his who'd been all through basic training with him, a friend that he got on really well, well with, ran out of the cover of the ditch run to his friend and started to drag him back to a place of safety. And when he'd done that, a bullet took out his friend and killed him instantly. And the utter guilt of that um, was just overwhelming and overpowering. Um, And even though the parents of this young lad who laid down his life for his friend came down, I think, all the way from Newcastle uh, to talk to him and just say, look, if the roles were reversed, would you have done the same? He said in a heartbeat, and I said, then we don't hold anything against you. We know that he'd done it because you were his close friend. But the young lad couldn't live with the guilt, and he ended it all. Um, so I suddenly thought to me, you know, the wonderful truth is that Christ died for you. Christ died for you. What impact does it have on your life? It just may be, yeah, we agree theologically that Jesus died for my sins. We, we can know the, 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 the theology of atonement. We can know the theology of redemption. But what does it mean that Jesus died for you? Does it have an impact on your life? Just from my own life, I, I, I try to, not all the time, because I, I don't, don't always get around to do it, but... I tried to, at certain times in my Christian life, where I just focus on nothing else but the cross. Focus on the love that Jesus died for me, knowing me, knowing me by my name, knowing every sin and every failure, every wart and every blemish. And he went to the cross for me. 
And I believe that when we realize the impact of that amazing love that Jesus has for us, then it should make us more merciful, more gracious, more humble, with a deeper desire to love, serve, and forgive. And then Jesus says, I no longer call you servants. I now call you friends. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything the Father told me. So here Jesus is now beginning to draw his disciples into a deeper intimacy and friendship. And he wants to reveal more of the gospel to them, more of his heart, more of what he's about. So here, but the most amazing thing is, as you go through the letters of the New Testament, you go with what the Apostle Paul, Jude, Peter, James, they all begin their letters by saying we are bondservants of Jesus Christ. Because the most important thing in Christian ministry is to have a servant's heart. And then Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Now, I was sharing this. The <laughs> school I went to was a rugby school. I love rugby now then, but I didn't love rugby then. Uh, and um, it always used to be, you'd stand in the playground and you'd get the captain of the rugby team and he'd come along and he'd choose people for his team. And then it was, choose you, choose you. And I was always at the back, the last one to be chosen, <laughs> you know, to take part in it. And... Uh, uh, it wasn't, a case, it wasn't a case, hey, I'm chosen. I'm the only one left, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it's one of the great mysteries of Scripture, God's sovereignty in our salvation. We come to Christ because he first came to us. We're told that he knew us, you know, in our mother's womb, that before the foundation of the world, he chose us in love to belong to him. He set us apart for himself. In Ephesians it says to be his workmanship. And that word workmanship can mean poetry. He had a purpose and a design for us. And Kate and myself know that we're down at Chatterbox and now here. We're so thankful for Ian. Thank you Ian for coming along and helping us on that. He's letting the, some of these people know that they have a purpose that they are important, that God loves them, and that they're just not spectators. Um, many years ago, I used to know this lad, and um, he worked in a cafe, and whenever I saw him, he told me how he was an extra on the Ben-Hur, um, was it Ben-Hur, the big biblical drama, Ben-Hur, and uh, I said, all right, I said, he said, yeah, he said, he said, I was one of the gladiators, he said, um, there, so I said, so how long was you in there for? He said, about five seconds, but you can see me. He said, just, just, you know. He said, only briefly, but you can actually see me. So I said, okay. You know, there's no extras in God's kingdom. None of you are an extra. You're God's workmanship, chosen in Christ before the creation of the world, and he loves you and has a purpose for you. Now, I've worked um, in a number of different charity backgrounds, and um, I'm trying to see how the best way to. Uh, Chris, Christians don't have the monopoly on love, you know. Um, uh, I've, I've met some wonderful, wonderful people in this charity organization who had what I would say is very good reasons for not doubt, for, for staying away from the church, for experience, and for what's happened in their life, yet they were loving, caring people. And Jesus says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit, everlasting fruit, fruit that is abundant, fruit that is so amazing that it will have eternal impact upon people's lives. And I find that incredible. The church is meant to be so radically different. It's meant to be a place where his love overflows and Jesus said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples when we love each other in that way. And there's such a, 
Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, and I really believe there's such a close link here between fruit bearing and answered prayer. Um, what's the point if I'm wandering around being hard-hearted and cold and indifferent to people, critical, and then saying, Lord Jesus, I ask this in your name. If I'm not bearing fruit, what's the point of me saying in Jesus' name? I mean, you may agree or disagree with that. It's just something that's been on my heart, you know. And so wherever we ask in his name, even the little things like that today. I don't know, that little lady who prayed earlier, I thought it was a wonderful prayer. <laughs> it's really great. God loves all our prayers. It doesn't have to be a fully mature prayer. Prayers in Jesus' name, our Heavenly Father listens to, you know. I've been asked before, well, can I pray the fact that my washing machine's broken down? Yes, you can. We've prayed for people at uh, Chatterbox because their dog's been ill. <laughs> We've prayed about hamsters. <laughs> prayer, all sorts of things, people's hearts and so we pray for, for these things and then Jesus says this is my command, love one another now command Jesus commands this so can love be commanded can, you know I was thinking of the um, uh, David Koresh who was the, um, uh, the cult leader of, the, of um, um, a big group in America in which hundreds of people died and apparently every morning he would command people to stand before him in the church and say that they loved him and they would obey him Jesus has gone through all this and says the source of his love for us must be the source of our love for other people that's why Jesus commands us to love he doesn't tell us to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps say love more, love more, love more we love because he first loved us His love should, should mean that we desire to be more self-sacrificial, more forgiving, to erase all bitterness, to seek reconciliation. It should be a love that heals and a love that restores. I know that I've mentioned this before when I was on uh, here, but it's just something that's struck me. Uh, many of you may have seen the film um, the colour purple and there's that beautiful part in the film where there's a, a lady Miss Seeley Miss Seeley knows that um, her friend Miss, Miss Sophia is losing her sight and every once a week she's dropped off at the local hardware store and she has a shopping list and she has to go and get the shopping for her rich white owners and yet Miss Seeley waits there and she takes the shopping list of her and she goes round and she does the shopping for her and brings it back so that the, these people's, um, the mayor who he over, oversees his servant girl will never find the truth. And many years later, they're sitting around the dinner table and Miss Sophia says these words. She says, Miss Seeley, she says, I was such a broken person. She says, I was at the end of my rope. And she said, then I met you. And when I met you, I knew there was a God. What a wonderful testimony that is, guys that people might change their life or change their view because they see something of Christ in us. And if we're looking at it and say, well, it's a Hollywood film, I want to finish by telling you about a friend of mine. Um, he was quite discouraged about what effect he was having as a Christian until this lady came up to him and took him to one side. She said, you know, she said, um, I never took Christianity seriously until I met you. And she said, there's something about you that's made me think twice about it, you know. So guys, let's continue to walk in humility, to walk in gentleness, continue to love one another, continue to seek the presence and power of his Holy Spirit, and God can do great things for simple people like us. Amen.